About 15 years ago, my old high school group decided that we were going to attempt to contact my friend Ben's biological dad. He had recently died before he got to know him. Now, Ben was absolutely wild. He wasn't scared easily. My high school sweetheart was with us and he was absolutely terrified. I owned a necklace that had items placed on it for protection from spirits. To help ease his anxiety, I placed the necklace around his neck. We partook in the devil's lettuce and started our session giggling. I was no believer in Ouija boards. It didn't bother me one bit that we decided to do this in an abandoned church deep in the woods either. Only my boyfriend was terrified, which caused our friends to tease him mercilessly. The board was set up and we got serious. We had no idea, however, just how serious this was about to become. As the planchette moved to spell his father's name, I smiled, thinking that this was his closure. He was clearly doing it because he had refused to share the name beforehand. It had to be him. But looking into his eyes, I saw something I had never seen etched into his face. It was fear. I can't remember how it all went down, but suddenly the board was spinning and it had spelled out murder. I was starting to feel cold, even in the heat. That's when it all went to crap. The pews, already broken, were shaking uncontrollably, even toppling over. We were in a back room that was essentially empty, but we ripped open the door to discover the pews falling over. It started a massive panic to get out of the building. As I was running, I realized my boyfriend wasn't with us in the woods. I turned back right as Ben and a few others pulled off in their cars. Once I re-entered the dilapidated church, my boyfriend was stuck, literally stuck to the floor, screaming. The building was still shaking. It was ice cold, and it felt like a sock had been shoved in my mouth. I remember my best friend helping me carry him out of the building. Within an instant, he had his wits about him and refused to talk about what happened. He looked like he'd just been through war. He opted to keep my protection necklace on, citing that the demon may follow one of us. We never really talked about what happened. That was very strange for my very open friend group. We knew it wasn't an earthquake, because we live just about an hour below the Blue Ridge Mountains of Appalachia, and we never get quakes that could move furniture like that. And to be honest, I felt something dark around me, until a cleansing 11 years later after the scariest haunting I'd ever experienced happened. I don't know what we released or have any clue how it could have been a natural event. Something threw those church pews to pieces and needless to say, we never went back. I will never forget this Wednesday night as long as I live. It was the summer before seventh grade, sometime in July. It was Wednesday night, early Thursday morning. The evening before, my family had watched the old school show, Unsolved Mysteries. I awoke in the night, lying on my right side, awake, but my eyes still shut, completely silent. None of us ran fans back then to aid in sleep. I was awake and basically waiting to fall back asleep again. However, I decided to open my eyes. On the right side of my bed, right there, was a being seemingly fixated on a plush bear that I kept in bed with me. And this being fit all of the descriptions that I've always heard or watched on television of an alien. Shorter, pale gray skin, and those awful eyes, huge, black, and slanted, staring at my bear, right by my bed. Honestly, I cannot put into words how I felt right at that moment. 
I was only just about 12. At some point, I pulled my covers over my head and felt an awful rushing through my body of super warm, then cool, then warm again. Only later in my life did I understand that I was most likely feeling shock. I couldn't scream. I felt frozen. Too scared to scream, maybe. What if I did scream? My mother and stepfather and two brothers would hear me. What the heck would they do if they came running into my room and saw this thing? What would it do? Is it going to kill me? Abduct me? What if it already had and it was returning me? All of these thoughts plus a million more just raced through my young mind. It's awful just recounting it all. Again, how could I ever forget something traumatic like this? So, being such a brave 11-year-old, and after what felt like 12 hours, I decided to try and scare it. I decided that I would thrash my legs up and down from under my covers as hard as I could. I know, horrifying, right? I was so petrified, though. So, I did this, and then remained under my covers, just waiting. Nothing happened. So I stayed under the covers. This had to be at least close to going on two hours from when I first opened my eyes and saw this thing. As I lay wide awake, I heard a noise. To this day, I still can't explain exactly how it sounded. The sound felt as if it surrounded me and was coming from outside. It was crisp, clean sounding, maybe mechanical, but maybe not lasting only about two seconds, a sound that I had definitely never heard before and have never heard since. As soon as I heard the sound, something in my mind told me, oh, they're gone. As crazy as it sounds, I firmly believed that the sound was their transportation leaving. Needless to say, I didn't sleep the rest of the night or early morning. It took me so long to confide in my family about this terribly scary incident. Of course, they did not believe me. However, now, from time to time, my mother will mention it and suggest that maybe that's why I suffer from insomnia now. Very well could be. This is the first time that I've shared this story publicly, though, and it would be reassuring to hear any other stories of similar happenings. When I was 8 to 10 years old, in the mid-1990s, my mom worked at a carpet company near Beaufort, Georgia. The building had a storefront where customers could walk through and look at the samples, and in the back there was a huge warehouse where all kinds of flooring was stored. There was a loading and unloading area with large bay doors that opened up to a concrete loading lot. The loading lot was against an overgrown wooded area but the area still had rural housing dotted here and there, so you could see the backs of a few houses a bit away through the woods. In general, the building always gave me the creeps. I would run around the huge hanging carpets in the warehouse while my mom was working up front. One day, while I was waiting for my mom to get off work, the big bay doors were opened, so I went out in the loading area to play outside. After a few minutes, I heard what sounded like a train coming down the tracks. Of course, when you're a kid, you get really excited about that stuff. So I ran out a little farther into the loading lot. Sure enough, I heard a train horn and I could see a train coming down the tracks from the right of the building. I put my hands over my eyes to shield them from the sun so I could see better. And I watched this robin egg blue, shiny metal train coming down the track. I remember seeing a lot of rivets. At the time I called them screws because I didn't know what rivets were. On the train and windows that came down, not up. Specifically, I saw people sitting in it. And especially a lot of ladies with these kind of round looking hats. 
and a kid running down the middle of the train car. I saw a man smoking a pipe, and I remembered thinking, must be in the smoking section. To give you a better idea, the train front was rounded and the cars were rectangular. The robin egg blue was in some details, like one of the panels under each window, stripes going up the front, and a few other small areas. The rest was really shiny, like metal. It seemed like one long train, because the cars were attached really close together. I watched this train pass by, and I was really excited about it. It seemed like my mom came out almost right after it passed to tell me she was ready to leave. I said, I saw the train, it just passed by. She was really confused and told me that there were no trains that passed there. I lamented that there most definitely was a train and I told her everything about it. She said, there's no train that can even come back here. The train tracks end right down there. I seriously thought she was pulling my leg, so I laughed and I said, uh-uh. I ran down there and, sure enough, the train track ran out of track just around a bend that wasn't visible from the lot. I swore to her that I had just seen the train pass by, and she swore, of course, that I was making it up. As I thought about it, I couldn't really say that I saw any specific facial features of the people on the train, though. I remembered the hats, the kid, the pipe smoking, but I couldn't remember what a single face looked like. I kind of dropped it because, yeah, the tracks clearly ended and a train couldn't have gone through. But I brought it up to her and explained the detail of the train again in recent years. She thought I had made it up and couldn't believe the details. But I remember all these years later, and I think she kind of got spooked by it because she finally admitted that she also felt creepy in that building sometimes. This is the story of Madeline, the doll that has my face. For context, my mom is the original owner of Madeline, but Madeline has been mine since I was a child. Madeline was bought by my mother about 35 years ago, long before I was born. There's a possibility that she's a lot older than that, as she was secondhand when my mom bought her. These are my experiences with this doll. I'm well aware that creepy doll is a trope, but stay with me. Madeline, I named her, is a porcelain doll with a soft body filled of horse hair, with her hands and feet and face made of plain white porcelain. Her hair, according to a doll expert I had her repaired by a few years ago, is a combination of horse and human. She's about 30 centimeters long, with brown hair, blue eyes, wears a blue cotton dress with embellishments, black leather lace-up boots, and a somewhat Victorian underdress. I believe she was pretty common, a generic doll type. I base this off the fact that I took her to doll shows as a child to find out a little bit more about her, since she doesn't have any marks. And another lady had her almost exact identical replica, same dress, same colors, hair, and everything. So she must have been pretty common. The only difference? The face. The lady and I compared the dolls, vividly pointing out how my doll's face was almost identical to mine. I'm not saying it's impossible to have dolls who look somewhat similar to you. I mean, that's just good marketing, really. But at the time, I had a jaw problem that required surgery, and the doll's jaw perfectly matched mine heavy overbite. This lady's doll didn't at all. Given the dolls had everything else exactly the same except the face, it just sort of makes me wonder if at some point her face had been replaced or repainted before my mom purchased her. I don't believe Madeline to be a harmful entity, but a few strange things have happened that make me wonder. As a child, I kept her on my bed on the top bunk. I had one of those loft beds with a desk under it while I was at school. 
If someone was to change the sheets, they'd put her back, because Mom was always worried that the dog would eat her. She was always on my bed, and I was the only kid in the house, so I'm the only one who played with her at the time. At school one day, I would have been about 10 years old, I broke my right wrist. Most children will break something in childhood, and I had fallen out of a tree. I remember getting home from the hospital at about 8 p.m., and I was a bit dopey from the assistance they'd given me. Because I couldn't climb the bunk in a cast, Mom made me up the mattress on the ground. I had grabbed Madeline so that Mom could move the bed, when suddenly, Madeline's right hand dropped onto the carpet. I would brush this off, but more has happened. Once I needed stitches in my head. I came home and there was a chunk of Madeline's hair gone. I had jaw correction surgery. Now neither of us have an overbite. I've had knee surgery and have a scar on my right foot. And she has just had a crack repaired on her right foot. Mom, who hadn't seen her in a few years, as I've had things in storage, recently made a comment and it's what made me decide to tell my story. She said, I remember her having a much younger looking face when you were little. Could this doll be aging with me, experiencing things like I am? I really don't know what it means, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. When I was in college, I was a banquet worker at a hotel. One night we were hosting a wedding and we ran out of trash bags. We couldn't find any anywhere. So my boss asked me if I could track down a room service cart and grab anything I could find, even if it was small. At this point, it's almost one in the morning. The wedding is winding down and the hotel is quiet. I didn't have access to the room service closets or laundry as a banquet server, so I was literally just going floor to floor, hoping that somebody had left their cart out. Finally, on the sixth floor, I saw a cart at the far end of the hall. I could hear a baby crying, and I saw one of our hotel provided bassinets in the hall next to a closed room door. I had to pass the bassinet to get to the cart, it was empty, as it should have been. As I got closer, the crying became louder. It made absolute sense to me, but it gave me this icky feeling in my stomach. I tried not to think anything about it. The baby must be in the room crying and the parents parked the bassinet outside because they decided not to use it, right? I raided the cart for the roll of bags and I noticed that the cart belonged to my friend Juana. She had an Aerosmith sticker on her cart, so I knew that it was hers. The next day I saw her at work and I mentioned that I had stolen her bags and apologized because she probably had to hunt some down at the very beginning of her shift. I then jokingly thanked her for leaving it next to the bassinet or baby room and I joked about how unsettling it felt to be in an empty hotel corridor next to an empty bassinet while listening to a crying baby in the wee hours of the morning. She was like, that's weird. I cleaned a room on that floor at the very beginning of my shift. I took the bassinet back down to the rollaway storage room first thing yesterday morning. That family checked out before you even got here. We discussed how unusual it was to have more than one family with a baby request a bassinet so close together, especially on the same floor. We rarely had to dig out a bassinet. At that point, we kind of thought that maybe it was two different families with two different babies who got a bassinet, but it was still strange. As I was leaving and clocking out in the laundry room, Juana stopped me to tell me, that the bassinet shouldn't have been there. She double checked the logs. No other families had requested one or even been there. 
we have a checkout sheet for bassinets and rollaway beds. So that if we need one, and we can't find one, we know where they were the last time they were used. Sure enough, Juana's room was the last one to have a bassinet. The sheet showed another coworker checking it out for the family when they arrived, and Juana checking it back into the rollaway room over 12 hours before I saw it in the hallway. I guess technically she could have forged her check-in signature, but why would she have done that? There would have been no point. And she clearly recalled returning it to the closet. Regardless of whether or not that bassinet should have been there, the crying baby definitely shouldn't have because there was no child, no family checked into that room or even on that floor. The family had checked out early and had been long gone before I went hunting for a cart. This isn't my story, but it is my parents and two incredibly close family friends who told it. Before I was born, the four of them used to hang out a lot. They would often drive far out into the Mojave Desert, just to party and to drink around a fire and have a good time. For this story, I'm going to call my dad Conrad and my mom Stacy. Their friends, I'll call Brad and Gina. So they drive all the way out into the desert and have a fire. It's summertime and it's hot. Although it's the middle of the night, it's still warm. My mom, Stacy, and her friend Gina were starting to get scared about tarantulas and decided that they didn't want to camp out there after all. So all four of them started driving back. It was like two o'clock in the morning and they were on a dirt road that went for miles and miles with nothing on it. Suddenly, up ahead in the headlights, they saw the silhouette of a man in a long black trench coat with a wide brimmed hat. The collar of his coat was pulled up. He was walking alongside the road, going the same direction that they were driving. My dad grew up hitchhiking a lot, and he used to pick up hitchhikers as well. So my mom knew that my dad would consider stopping and talking to this guy to see if he needed a ride. But they got this terrible feeling about him. My mom always said that just in the way he was walking, the way he looked and how he was dressed, and how he was just out there in the middle of nowhere with nothing, he just emitted this really messed up energy that felt absolutely terrifying and even evil. Gina felt the same way. My dad starts joking, hey, let's pick this guy up. And my mom and Gina immediately start screaming and crying and begging him not to. They were in the back seat. My dad was driving and Brad was in the passenger seat. Gina was even kind of punching my dad in the back, screaming, no, don't stop, don't stop. I guess my dad slowed way down as he passed him though, and they all turned to look at him as they went by. But the moment that they passed him, he was gone. He disappeared into thin air. It's not like there were rocks or trees or anything to hide behind. The weird thing is, I grew up hearing this story from my parents, but living far away from their friends. When I was very young, we moved up north, and they lost touch. Although whenever we would come back to California to visit, we'd always get together with them, and it was like nothing had changed. I moved back to California as an adult, and I work for Gina now. One of our first conversations when I came back was about the hat man. She brought it up, not me. And word for word almost, it was the exact same story that my parents had always told me growing up. To be honest, I've always secretly feared, yet been very intrigued by this entity because of their story. 
and then so many more stories that I have now read online. I couldn't believe it was such a big phenomenon when I first found it on the internet, because I was growing up just hearing my parents' story long before the internet even existed. To this day, he fascinates and terrifies me. Sometime in the early 1980s, my family lived in Arizona, as my father was stationed at an army base near Sierra Vista, which is some 70 or so miles south of Tucson. My father, myself, our neighbor, and his three sons were going to lend a hand in the construction of the neighbor's friend's home in the desert, a little over the halfway point between Sierra Vista and Tucson. I'm not sure what a couple of teenagers and a couple of eight-year-old boys were supposed to do, but we were going to be camping in the desert over the weekend. So it was an adventure to me and quality time with my father. For the sake of anonymity and to make explanations easier, we'll call their father Jerry, the eldest brother James, the second oldest Mike, and the youngest Tommy. At any rate, we got to where the site was and we set up camp. Our dad's and Jerry's buddies headed out to get some pizzas from the Benson, the closest town to us, close to a half hour away. It was about an hour before dusk and the four of us still at camp were just sitting around a campfire telling stories. The sun had now set and we were checking out the stars that were starting to come into view. Tommy and I hadn't really noticed anything until James had told us to get in the tent as he got up and pulled a rifle out of Jerry's truck. Quickly looking around, we took notice of several pairs of eyes just beyond the reaches of the campfire's light. There was a pack of coyotes all around the camp. Tommy and I made a mad dash for the tent and hunkered down inside, peering out at these watchful eyes through little mesh windows. That's when I noticed something odd. One of these coyotes wasn't like the rest of them. Its eyes seemed to be farther up off the ground than those of the others. The eyes were a deeper yet brighter shade than that of the other coyotes. The campfire made them all appear as silhouettes against the desert backdrop, but this one was much larger. To make it even stranger, the group of coyotes on one side of the camp were pretty much evenly spaced apart but the ones that I was looking at seemed to be farther away from the odd one. It was almost like they were intentionally keeping their distance from it. I'm not entirely sure what I was seeing, but I seemed to instinctively know that what I was looking at was not a coyote. Tommy and I were both scared, but we were scared for different reasons. I was so terrified, I was practically trying to get as low to the ground as I could while still keeping an eye on this odd coyote. If I could have gone past the bottom lining of the tent and buried myself in the sand, I would have. I heard the crack of the rifle as James sent around toward one of the groups. They scattered, but not the odd one. He stood his ground, didn't move an inch. James sent another round off toward the odd one. It flinched and stepped back a few feet. I don't know if he hit it or not. I just know that it scared the crap out of me, and I wanted it to go away. Moments later, the headlights of my dad's van came into view, and this odd coyote, along with the others, ran off. I didn't want to accept the explanation of just coyote, but I did, simply because I didn't know what it was, and I wanted to convince myself that I didn't see what I did. This was one of the few times that I have encountered something that terrified me. Some 30 years later and a whole lot of research, and I'm pretty sure I know what I saw. I just don't want to come out and say it. The Girl from Catholic School 
My story happened in 2013. For some context, I was staying in my grandparents' home, which was over a hundred years old in South Africa. I had experienced other unexplainable occurrences, like waking up one night to have my rosary wrapped around my neck, choking me. This event had left ligature marks around my neck. The strange part is that I had slept in a rosary for years, and I had never had anything like this happen. Other strange things that went on were doors opening on their own, the kind of doors that have handles that require twisting to open. The story I'm telling you today centers around this old house. My grandparents decided to sell it, as they were both in their 70s. In 2013, I was alone at home with our housekeeper as I was studying. The real estate agent showed up to the house unannounced. I opened up for her and out stepped an older Muslim woman. With this woman were two little girls dressed in uniforms that matched the Catholic primary school I had attended many years prior. The one girl had the same fair complexion as her mother. The other girl was definitely Indian and not Arabic. I found this kind of strange, but I figured she was probably just a school friend. I welcomed them into the house and they looked around. As the agent and the guests made their way upstairs, the little girl who appeared to be Indian stared at me as her hand trailed along the banister. Then I went to go unlock the other home on the property where my uncle stayed with his family. Right behind me were the two little girls. They rushed into the house and made their way into my cousin's bedroom. The Indian girl was sitting on the bed petting the cat who was fast asleep and the other girl was looking around at some toys in the room. I told the girl on the bed that the cat usually doesn't really like people touching her and that she's lucky. The girl just smiled at me. Finally, the parent and the agent arrived at the flat on the property where we were, so I stepped outside to give them some space. Once they had finished, they thanked me, and the agent, the mother, and the lighter-skinned girl, who I had assumed was her daughter, had stepped outside. I paused for a moment, and eventually asked the real estate agent if she could please call the other girl to come outside so that I could lock up. The mother and the agent looked at me, puzzled. What other girl? They asked. The mom said, I only brought my daughter. I laughed at them and told them that I don't really have time to joke around because I really did need to study for my final exams. Their faces fell. I could now see that they were not kidding. I rushed into my cousin's bedroom, only to find it empty, apart from the cat still sound asleep on the bed. I tried to compose myself as I said goodbye to the real estate agent and the prospective buyer. After they left, I asked the housekeeper if she had seen who got out of the car. She responded that it was just two women and a little girl. I know that I did not imagine this because I clearly saw her. She had thick black hair cut into a bob, and she had a blue Alice band. The way she smiled at me. This experience still haunts me to this day. I don't know if it was an apparition that followed the little girl from school, and maybe knew that I also attended that school. Maybe that's why she showed herself to me. I really don't know. I have never come up with a good explanation for what that was. This occurred over 20 years ago, but is still fresh in my mind. My son was born early, at 32 weeks. We were lucky, and he had few issues, and we were able to bring him home a month after he was born. He came home on oxygen and caffeine due to bradycardia. Once we were home, strange things began to happen. The cat refused to go into his room, and before he was born, I was forever removing said cat from his room. Our dog would sit at the bottom of the stairs and tilt his head, as if he was listening to something. I would be changing his diaper and start talking as I thought his dad had come into the room 
only to turn and find out I was alone. A friend gave him a peekaboo big bird toy that would say peekaboo when you covered and then uncovered its eyes. This toy would go off all the time, even after I put it into a box in the closet. I often felt that I was not alone in that house. My parents had given us an angel care baby monitor as a gift. This had a pad that was placed under the mattress and an alarm would sound if it didn't detect any movement after a certain amount of time. As our son was tiny, only five pounds when he came home, this alarm would go off often. I would wake up, walk into his room, turn it off and check on him. He was always fine. And I never felt that it was anything but the fact that he was so tiny that the pad didn't pick up his breathing. During this time, I would often dream of a woman that I would find in his room. I never saw her directly, but I would dream that I saw the shadow of a woman with long hair standing and reaching into his crib. The dreams never scared me, but I did find them very odd, yet comforting at the same time. I can't remember how long he'd been home, but it was at least a month. He was still on oxygen and still on caffeine. Our bed was to the left of our bedroom door, and I slept on the right-hand side next to the door. My husband slept on the left. I was asleep and was awoken by being shaken roughly on the door side of the bed. I woke up and looked over at my husband and said, why are you shaking me? Only to realize he was completely asleep and on the wrong side to have shaken me. I immediately jumped up and ran to my son's room. I flipped on the light, something I had never done to this point, and I heard a gasp from the crib. Often when babies spontaneously stop breathing, you need to startle them to get them to start again. I truly believe that he had stopped breathing and that my turning on the light startled him into breathing again. After this episode, the dreams and the strange occurrences with the pets and toy continued until my son came off the oxygen and caffeine. Once that happened, the odd occurrences stopped. The pets stopped acting weird and the big bird toy never went off on its own again. I really believe that something or someone came back from the hospital with us to keep him safe. The feeling I got from my dreams was that it was a young woman, maybe early to mid twenties and indigenous. I'm Canadian. I will always be grateful for them watching over him and shaking me awake that night so that I could startle my son into breathing again. I honestly don't know how to put this or where to begin, and now that I think of it, I don't know who would believe this, but it's true. This happened two years ago when I enlisted into the army, and I did my basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. At the beginning of the cycle, it seemed normal, nothing out of the ordinary until white phase had started. I will only share four experiences to avoid this being too long so hopefully you at least enjoy the stories. Whether or not you believe me is up to you. Experience 1 One day, I was a battle buddy for one of my friends who had passed out due to the heat, so he had to stay at the bay for a little while. We were on the other end of the bay that has 55 bunks in it. My roster number was 340 and he was 342. So we were sitting by our bunks talking about random stuff when out of the blue, one of the locks on the 301's locker jingled out of nowhere. Now keep in mind, we're the only ones in the bay, let alone the entire company area, because the others are out training. We stop what we're talking about, and he asks me to go check it out. I say no, so we check under the bunks and nobody's there. Experience 2 the second incident happened one night when I woke up at about one in the morning. I slept on the bottom bunk, 
and the way that I slept had my head facing the middle of the bay. In front of our bunks was a blue tape line, where we would have to line up for different purposes. So I woke up and looked toward the middle, and I thought I saw outlines of people walking back and forth. At least four or five people passed my bunk, or so I thought. I hopped up and threw on my boots and began to tow the line. Then the fire guard came up to me and asked me what I was doing. When I told him what I saw, he said that there was nobody else awake and I should get some sleep. Experience three. This incident happened a few nights after the second one. Again, I woke up at about one o'clock in the morning, but this time it was different. I didn't see anybody walking around. Instead, I physically saw a shadow figure sitting at the edge of my bunk. I knew it wasn't one of the others because it was pitch dark, the shadow I mean. The figure was darker than dark. I just kind of froze up and tried getting the attention of the guy next to me, but he wasn't having it. Eventually, the figure faded away right in front of me, but it was still pretty creepy. This last experience I'll tell you isn't too serious, but it's still weird. One day I was in the latrine and I was shaving and getting ready for the day before anyone else had woken up. Then, randomly, all the paper towel machines, which are motion activated, went off one by one. I checked to see if anybody had come in, but I knew nobody did. I would have heard the door and footsteps but I was just trying to convince myself that there was some kind of an explanation. These are four of the weird and creepy things that happened to me at basic. For disclosure, I'm not crazy, and I also don't know how to explain any of this. I mainly give credit to it most likely being the stress getting to me. I'm not the only one who had experiences though. These are just mine. Even the drill sergeants had experiences of their own that they told us. So, are there ghost recruits wandering around the training areas? Maybe. This story still gives me chills to this day. When I was in the fifth grade, I had my very first paranormal experience, as well as many of my classmates. Our school was known to be haunted for whatever reason, as well as the high school and the middle school. In 1991, before I was born, there was a tornado, and it was rumored that the bodies were buried all over the city, which probably isn't true, but I just thought I'd mention it. I enrolled in the elementary school because I had moved and my first day was kind of rough. I could tell I probably wasn't going to fit in, but I made some great friends toward the end of the school year. We all had our own little friend groups and stayed on separate sides of the playground. But one day we were all on the playground and one of the students in my class named Kyle saw a person wandering around in the woods. He told the teacher, but she didn't believe him. So he started telling every one of our classmates, including myself, that he had seen somebody in the woods. Now, our school was surrounded by woods. Sometimes the high schoolers would smoke in the woods, but this wasn't the case. It was only a few minutes after Kyle had told everybody what he saw that the teacher would finally believe him. The look on her face, you could tell she had seen something that wasn't human. You just know that look. We weren't allowed on the playground for a couple of days after that happened for our safety. So we would have recess in the lunchroom. The teachers would bring out board games and snacks at what was supposed to be recess time. Well, during recess time, this girl named Serena walked up to me and asked me if I had seen the person in the woods. I said, no, the teacher was trying to get us all in as fast as she could. so. I didn't really have time to look. After that, she sat me down and showed me a locket. I didn't really know why she was showing me a locket and how it would somehow possibly connect to the conversation until she told me that she knew the person outside 
and that the person had given her the locket. Serena didn't really have any friends. She was pretty lonely. During recess, she would always sit by the fence, all by herself. A few days after Serena had shown me the locket, we were finally allowed to go outside for recess again. And here comes Serena, walking toward me with the locket in her hand. She told me she was missing the locket for a day or two, but she found it over by the fence with a picture of a girl in it that looked exactly like the person that Kyle saw. Fast forward to a few months later, all of my classmates are participating in a musical at the high school. We all sit behind the curtain, waiting for our turn in the musical. Serena, myself, and some of the others were left behind. And for some reason, there's a staircase behind the curtain that leads up to a door. As we were about to go on stage for our role, we see the same girl going up the staircase, never to be seen again. I was in the same district until 10th grade, and we were constantly on that stage for many more musicals and for theater, and I never saw her again. To this day, I don't really know who she is. I just know that I don't think she was alive anymore. The whole thing with the locket never made sense either. I still have a lot of questions, but it was definitely weird. About 20 years ago, my best friend at the time and his wife had her father, Felix, living with them. They were his caretakers. They pretty much did everything for him, and that included cleaning him every morning because of his incontinence and difficulty holding his bowels. They really did a great job and deserved my compliments several times. One day, my friend Mike went into Felix's room when he would normally be awakening only to find him in full rigor mortis. Felix had sadly passed sometime in the night. I was employed at the time as a cemetery pre-need salesman, but also could arrange at-need services, and so I did. I helped them to prepare Felix's final resting location and waived my commission as it just didn't feel right charging it. These two individuals had done so much to make his last years comfortable I just couldn't take that money. About a week later, we held the service, which I officiated. It was well attended and we gave Felix the send off he deserved. I rode home in the limo provided for the family by the funeral home and cemetery after the service. And we all sat around for a while, just decompressing and taking a well needed break. The wife, Mary, then noticed that there was a message on their answering machine. This was during the time where we had physical landlines and attached answering machines. She pressed the play button and the timestamp that the machine read was the identical time as when we had started the graveside service. It was recorded at 11 a.m. sharp. We thought at first it was just somebody who had missed the service calling to wish condolences. When the recording started though, every jaw in the room dropped and an oddness to goodness chill filled the room. There were five of us present, Mike, Mary, the daughter, myself, my brother James, and a friend of theirs from across the street whose name I don't know. The background noise was the first thing we heard. It sounded like somebody was in a room with a large group of people. You know, lots of audible voices, but nothing we could discern. Then Felix spoke. The voice on the recording was clearly and unmistakably Felix. He said, please do not follow me. Then the recording stopped. We had what seemed like a recently deceased parent calling us during his own funeral service, begging us to please not follow him. The rest of the group talked about what he could have meant. Don't follow him to death. Not possible, they said. Don't follow his life choices. He had made many bad ones during his life. The daughter absolutely believes 
that he was saying, don't follow me into hell. She believed until her dying day that her father had made contact one last time, telling her to not follow his path and end up where he did once he took that step into the unknown. I always thought that was so strange. 20 years later, and I remember that moment and the stunned silence, shock, and fear, just like it happened yesterday. Nobody was comforted. It honestly felt chilling. I still don't know what he meant, but I am 100% certain that the phone call was definitely from Felix, and it definitely came from the other side. I know this story is going to sound weird and crazy, but hear me out. I'm not too familiar with this subreddit, but a friend of mine who's always talking about metaphysics, the twilight zone, simulation type stuff, loves this sub and keeps telling me to post my story. Anyway, here's my story. Two weeks ago, I was about to get ready for a party at six. Just before I started getting ready, one of my friends messaged me super excited because a guy she's had a crush on for the last four years finally asked her out and he was coming to the party with her. While I was texting her back, my younger brother walked into the room and asked if I could drive him to his friend's house, which I agreed to do. Then I went into the bathroom to have a shower and do my makeup. So I got in the shower, but when I went to wash my hair, I realized that my conditioner was finished. I was pretty ticked off because I had only bought it a couple of days beforehand, and it's an expensive brand. My younger sister always uses up my things, so I knew that she had used it all. She had also trashed the bathroom, leaving water everywhere and her dirty towel on the floor. I was pissed off, and I was about to get out of the shower in order to tell her off and get some more conditioner. But as I went to get out, I realized at the last second that she'd kicked the grippy mat that we have at the bottom of our shower tub up. Our shower and tub is super slippery without the grip mat. So as I went to step out, before I could realize it, my foot slipped and I fell neck down onto the edge of my tub. Time seemed to slow down in my head. And I remember that my last thought was, wow, this is how I die? How stupid. But here's the thing. At the moment of impact, I woke up in a start back in my bed. I know it sounds stupid and cheesy like something from a dumb Netflix show, but there's literally no other way to describe what happened. I was lying in my bed right before I got up to shower the first time, but I don't remember falling asleep. And the thing is, I've been a lucid dreamer for the last five years or so. And if this was a dream, it was way more vivid than anything I have ever experienced. What really weirded me out though, was that the exact same friend who texted me the first time, messaged me after I woke up to tell me that the guy she'd had a crush on had asked another girl out and that she was really bummed out about it and didn't want to come to the party. I was weirded out that there was some similarity between that and the dream but I didn't think about it much at first. As I went to reply, my younger brother came in to ask if I would take him to his friend's house. All the blood drained from my face. He just stood in the doorway looking confused and asked me what was wrong. I rushed to the bathroom, feeling like I was losing my freaking mind, and I went to check the conditioner bottle. I know this sounds completely crazy, but the bottle was finished just like before and the grip mat was kicked up. At that point, I went back to lie down in bed and I texted my friends to tell them that I would not be going to the party. I'm pretty sure that I slipped in the shower, died, and then woke up in some alternate dimension. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but I really don't know how else to explain this series of events. In any case, it's rattled me ever since.
being in my friend's room when I awoke having to pee. My friend had bunk beds and I was on the top bunk, so I had to hop down to make my way out of the bedroom and down the hall to the bathroom. I went into the hallway from my friend's room and because it was very dark, I kept one hand on the hallway as I made my way to the guest room door, which is located on the same side of the hallway as my friend's room. I knew that if I followed the wall to the guest room door, I could go straight across the hallway to the bathroom door, which is exactly what I did. I get into the bathroom, I turn on the light, I go pee, and when I finish, I look at myself for a minute in the mirror before returning to bed. Everything is normal up until this point. This isn't the first time that I've gotten up in their house in the night to use the bathroom, and I have always followed this same routine of following the walls with my hand in the dark. As I leave the bathroom, I do exactly the same thing to get back to my friend's room. I go straight across the hall from the bathroom door to the guest room door, and with one hand on the wall the whole time, I make my way back to my friend's room. This is where things get glitchy. I get to my friend's room and I enter it, but as I enter it, I'm not in my friend's room. I'm somehow in the office next to it. I realize immediately that this makes no sense because I had my hand on the wall the whole time as I had done countless times before, but here I am in the office. The office is not very big. It's a small square room with a closet next to the hallway door to my right as I enter it. Right away, I can see that there is light coming from inside the closet. So I turn and slide open the door. Inside the closet, there are four old TVs stacked one on top of the other. All of them are playing static. I am completely confused by this and I have no idea how I even got into the office to begin with, let alone why there are just four TVs in the closet playing static. I shake my head in confusion and decide to just go back to bed. I make my way out of the office, back into my friend's room, and although I'm still completely baffled by what just happened, I basically just go back to sleep. When I woke up the next morning, I immediately thought about what had happened, and I went straight into the office and opened the closet. There's nothing in there except for one jacket hanging on a hanger, right above where the TVs had been. I don't recall telling my friend or his family about this experience, and everyone that I've told since always says, well, obviously it was just a dream, which my logic really wants to agree with, but I know that this was not a dream. I recall every single moment from jumping out of the top bunk, walking down to the bedroom door, trying not to make a noise, everything. I remember how black the hallway was, the feeling of the wall on my fingers, every single detail, and everything about it was exactly the way it is in real life, except for the glitch. This story is real. First off, my whole life, I've been a tad perceptive. Not psychic, but just aware. I can feel energy. That feeling you get when your body tells you to run or fight. That feeling in your stomach, hundreds of knots at once. A true scare. I got that today, at work. I'd been working on a house in Palos Verdes. It's beachfront country in Southern California. We're taking down the garage to the studs. I can tell you that whatever is in this house was furious about it. Banging, knocks, catching figures out of the corner of your vision, disembodied voices, and just that feeling. There were only two of us there. I'm pretty big, so I can tear stuff down pretty easily. The guy I'm working with was wearing wireless headphones, so he couldn't really hear the things that I did. Whenever I would hear something, I would say, you didn't hear that? He would just shake his head. I don't really know the history of this house. 
The family living there is currently living somewhere else while we remodel. It's just day two, and I'm already starting to get freaked out. We started finishing up, putting all the tools away, and then I hear it. It sounded like something terrible was happening to someone. It was just a horrible scream. Even my partner heard it this time. Now do you hear it? I asked. He gave me a stern look and said, Why do you think I brought headphones? We both started to laugh nervously. I started to wonder because this is daytime. Why are they so prevalent? And if any of you were like pics or it didn't happen, I get that. It sounds strange, but it did happen and I was really scared. I didn't want to make things worse. I was already worried that we were basically destroying the spirit's place. I think homes have memories. They remember energy. I could feel it. Look, believe what you want. I'm not here to change minds or force ideas onto you. I just wanted to tell this story. We still have a few days left on this project. I'm wondering if anybody else has had experiences like this on site. Day 2 Hey, I'm just posting this update. We came back. Last night I had nightmares about zombies eating me, so there was that. I don't know what that means, if anything, but it was horrifying and unusual. I dreaded coming to the house. We opened the locked door to access the rest of the remodel. Now, I always lock up super tight because I have a lot of tools, but when we walked in today, my stuff had been thrown everywhere. I was furious, thinking kids had gotten in and stolen my stuff. I looked around and there were two windows boarded up solid with thick plywood an inch thick, probably ten screws in each. Both were still boarded up solid. And then came the confusion, trying to figure out what was taken, but nothing was missing. It was just all thrown around on the ground. It's funny, we didn't think to take a picture until after we had cleaned it all up. Today I will keep my eyes open for more activity. I just want to get done with this as soon as possible. Half a decade back, I embarked on a journey with my church group to a location just beyond the periphery of Pittsburgh. The trip was thrilling to me, an opportunity to be with my friends, and I was absolutely certain nothing out of the ordinary would happen. Until then, I had been skeptical about the existence of ghosts. The concept fascinated me, but it seemed implausible. A bit about our setting. Our accommodation was an eerie old church building that had an unsettling aura about it. I don't precisely recall its name, but it was in a dilapidated condition with revolting bathrooms. On our inaugural night there, my three friends and I were surprisingly given our own room, an allowance typically not granted to those under 18. Being around 15 or 16 years old with no chaperone, we were understandably eager to break the rules and stay up late. Since it was a warm night, we left the window open, and that's when we noticed something unusual. A figure was standing in the parking lot, staring up at our window, despite it being around 2 a.m. We attempted to engage in a conversation with it, but to no avail. It remained motionless. In an attempt to figure out who or what it was, my friends used their iPhone flashlight, revealing a chilling fact. This entity had no discernible face. It felt like a surreal dream. The moment we shone the light on it, it vanished. The next day, we discussed the incident with others and heard about a legendary ghost named Molly. Dismissing it as a fabricated tale, we decided it was just our imagination playing tricks on us, which was a comforting conclusion. We put the episode behind us for a few days. 
However, my friends claimed to have heard strange sounds one morning, although they never really elaborated. By the time they heard it, I had already departed. But the tale doesn't end there. We all stayed up late again, secure in our locked room, when abruptly the door burst open. My friend, whom we'll call T, mockingly referred to Molly using some derogatory terms, firmly believing we were being pranked. Almost instantly, the door slammed shut, resounding throughout the room. Panic ensued as the door began to creak open again, prompting us to dash out of the room. It's worth noting that the hallway lights were on, and we didn't see anyone else around, and we would have. We bolted downstairs, bumping into a woman who had awoken, sensing a disturbance. To our surprise, she revealed that she performed exorcisms. Following her advice, we placed a Bible beneath our door and took other forgotten measures to protect ourselves. That night has been indelibly etched into my memory. Several others claimed to have witnessed strange occurrences too, which provided us with some reassurance that we weren't losing our minds. Even to this day, the nature of what we saw remains a mystery, casting an unsettling chill over me whenever I recall it. Six years ago, my boyfriend at the time, husband now, woke me up sweating and shaking in absolute fear. I asked him what was wrong and he began stuttering and telling me that I would never believe him. He went on to tell me that he was woken up around midnight to this person standing at the end of the bed. Yes, my first thought was sleep paralysis as well, but he sat up and was ready to attack if he needed to. In his head, he heard a voice that wasn't him, telling him that it was okay and that they weren't there for any bad reasons. He said he felt immediately calm from that. He also noted that he was shocked with what a light sleeper I was and that his movements hadn't woken me. This being was unnaturally tall and had to crouch a little due to its height and us having been asleep in the basement. He said that this being reached out for a greeting and again began hearing a voice in his head saying, Hello. Nothing much else happened that night as my husband was frightened. All he remembered at the time was that the last thing he heard from it in his mind was, I'll see you again soon. And then he said it felt as if time had started again, not realizing that it ever felt like it stopped until that point and then he was back in reality, and that's when he woke me. What he thought had only been about a 10 to 15 minute encounter had actually taken over an hour. These visits continued for months, minimum once a week, max three to four times, but my husband got less and less frightened every time. This thing and him built a sort of friendship from what he explained to me. It had a name, but for the life of me, I can't remember what he said it was. It answered any and every question my husband had. I won't go into what those were here. But after a while, it just stopped. He stopped waking me up in the middle of the night or telling me about it the next morning. But the times were always the same. He would be awoken around midnight and they would have discussions about literally anything my husband was curious about. And then he would come back to reality and time would unfreeze again between 1 a.m. and 1.30 a.m., having only felt like the encounter had lasted a short period of time. Once it stopped, though, I can't emphasize enough just how much it stopped. I mean, full stop. It was like for him, it never happened. It's been six years, so I know this is choppy, but it's hard to remember everything with it having been so long ago now. I forgot about it for so long and I don't know what prompted me to remember it just about a week ago, but now I just can't stop thinking about it and the oddness of it all and how it just stopped so suddenly. He's literally never made mention of it ever again 
and I've never brought it up to him this last week in fear that he may think I'm crazy. Which, I don't know why that's my fear, but part of me thinks if there's a chance he's completely forgotten it, whether it be on his own or something else, he may think I've gone insane. Anyway, if you have any ideas or similar stories, please let me know. I'm trying to figure this all out and what happened to my husband, as it's literally keeping me up at night. I like stories about the paranormal, but I've never personally experienced anything, and I tend to be pretty skeptical about them. However, there was a weird experience that I wanted to share and see what people thought about. Back in 2009, I was in college a couple of hours away from home. My grandparents, who I lived with through the last two years of high school, were away from home at their second property, where they were building their retirement home for the weekend and I wanted to get off campus. So my friends, let's call them Jess and Nina, and I decided to go to the house for the weekend. My friend Jess claims to be sensitive. She has told me stories about things coming into her room when she was growing up, and I can tell she's genuine. But to my knowledge, science has yet to demonstrate the existence of any kind of life after death, so I remain skeptical. I could tell something was off as soon as we pulled up to the house. I'm grabbing my bag from the truck, and I look over to her to see her staring up at the house. I ask her if she's okay, and she just says one word, ocupado, and then proceeds to grab her bag from the truck and we all head inside. Let me give you the layout. The house was built in the 80s, and my grandparents bought the place in 99. The previous owner had died in the home, in his sleep, I think. It was a two-story brick home that backed up to a lake. It was quite a nice place to live, but there were also parts of the house that always used to creep me out for some reason. The front sitting room and dining room upstairs, and the stairs to the basement, where I lived in high school. But like I said, I never experienced anything. Anyway, my grandparents knew that we were coming down for the weekend, but they were going to be gone for a while, so they shut off all the water in the house, except for to the downstairs bathroom. We all go inside, and a few hours later, Jess decides to go downstairs to use the bathroom. Nina and I stay upstairs watching a movie. She's gone for quite some time, and when she comes back upstairs, she asks us what we wanted while she was in the bathroom. Nina and I just look at each other, confused. We hadn't left the room and we hadn't called for her. We didn't know what she was talking about. She asks if either one of us had come downstairs and tried to turn the bathroom door handle while she was in there. We looked at her, incredulous, and tell her that we had not. She grows pale and my heart starts to race. I think someone is in my house. Nina and I grab knives from the kitchen and go room to room searching for an intruder. We find nothing. The house is quiet for the rest of the weekend. I still think about that sometimes. I don't know what it was. Maybe my friend was daydreaming and maybe she got into her own head. Maybe she was messing with us, although she swears up and down that she wasn't and she looked genuinely terrified. Maybe there was someone in the house, though I'm pretty sure we would have heard them opening a door. Also, there was a security system that beeped if any door or window were opened. I just don't know. What do you think? This happened to me when I was a toddler, from around one to three years old. When I was little, I used to have really bad nightmares. They were so bad that I'd wake up in the middle of the night, screaming like I was being murdered. At one point, 
it got so bad that my parents actually called 911 because they weren't even sure if I was breathing or not. What were these nightmares about? Being so young, it's pretty hard to remember, but I can recall two of these nightmares. In the first one, I was at my grandparents' house, playing with a toy on the floor, while my grandma was doing something in the kitchen. Then, their dog barked from the other side of the house. I heard my grandma yell, Hey! at the dog. As soon as that happened, everything went quiet. I looked up from the toy to see a tall, shadowy figure where my grandma had been moments before. It just stood there, staring at me. It didn't have any distinguishable features. It was like I was staring at the shadow of a tall, skinny person. The second one is a lot shorter, but it's the one I remember the most. I was in my crib at night when I heard something from the doorway. I looked over to see the exact same shadowy figure staring directly at me from the doorway. I don't remember any of the other night terrors that I had when I was a kid, but I'm sure that they all involved this thing. It got to the point where I was terrified of shadows and loud noises. I understand why I was afraid of shadows, but for the life of me, I can't explain where the fear of loud noises came from. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that my grandma shouted at her dog right before the shadow person showed up. Maybe it had nothing at all to do with those nightmares. I really don't know. Normally, I wouldn't be concerned by this. For all I know, I saw something like this on TV when I was little and had nightmares about it. I wouldn't even consider it a paranormal experience if my mom hadn't seen the same thing I did. She came home late one night to find the entire apartment dark. Assuming my dad had just left for work, she walked toward her bedroom, which was at the end of the hallway and across from mine. That's when she saw the tall shadowy figure at the end of the hall in front of my bedroom. At first, she assumed it was my dad, so she got mad at it for scaring the heck out of her, but the figure didn't move. She reached behind her to turn on the light, and the figure vanished. She told me about this years later, and my dad backs up the claim, since he recalls getting a panicked phone call from my mom saying that there was a ghost in the apartment. And that's where it ends. A few years later, we moved out of that apartment and I have never experienced anything to do with that shadow ever again. Ever since then, I always sleep with the hallway light on because I'll never forget the feeling of absolute terror I had when I saw that shadowy figure staring at me from the doorway. My tale unfolds on the big island of Hawaii when I was around 10 or 11 years old. My father was an avid hunter of wild boars and sheep, and occasionally he would take our family to a remote cabin that my uncles had constructed. The exact location of the cabin is hard to pinpoint, but it was an hour's off-road drive up the mountain from an obscure road that branched off the main highway. This quaint one-story cabin's front door was a sliding glass door. Across from it, you could see three rooms, each furnished with two bunk beds, but no doors for privacy. The cabin's bathroom was a primitive outhouse, lacking light and running water, nestled within a clutch of trees and bushes. Despite the cabin's lack of amenities and poor ventilation, which made it quite chilly, the place had a certain charm. However, I couldn't shake off the sensation of spiritual presence, perhaps due to my uncle's story of an enormous battle that had taken place in the vicinity during ancient times. This immediately made me think of night marchers, which, although just a part of Hawaiian folklore, for some people, are perceived as extremely real entities by native Hawaiians. 
During this trip, my cousin, sister, and I found ourselves exploring the expanse around the cabin, an open field laden with grass, weeds, and bordering trees growing over lava rocks. Out of boredom, we picked up some hammers and started breaking into small lava tubes, hoping to discover something interesting. These tubes weren't massive like caves, but small pockets that had formed due to air bubbles trapped in the flowing and later hardened lava. You could identify them by merely tapping your shoe on the surface and listening to the sound. Much to our surprise, one such lava tube did contain something. A pile of bones, cushioned by long brown bird feathers. These bones, which didn't appear to belong to a human, but rather some animal, perhaps a chicken, were strikingly well preserved and still bore hints of pinkish red color, suggesting freshness. We were puzzled. How did these bones get inside the tube? Why weren't they destroyed by the lava? The only plausible explanation we could think of was that these bones were an offering to Pele, the fire goddess, given that the volcano hadn't been active for centuries. Out of respect, we quickly sealed the tube's opening with rocks and retreated, choosing not to mention this to our parents. The following morning, our father asked us if any of us had visited the outhouse early in the day. When we all denied it, he shared that he had seen a large figure standing at the sliding door, presumably having returned from the outhouse. Unable to discern the figure in the darkness, he dismissed it as a dream. However, the possibility that it might have been the entity whose offering we had disturbed terrified me. The figure could have been a human, but considering the cabin's remote location, it seemed very unlikely. Regardless, after that unnerving encounter, I never stayed at that cabin again. This is my story of a dude I happened to come across in the deep woods in Florida. This was in Ocala National Forest. I probably came across either a poacher's camp or a drug operation, and they put signs up to scare people away. In any case, my friend and I were hunting and stayed out past midnight looking for hogs. We realized we were way deeper into the woods than we had planned on being, and we began to walk out. We were probably three or four miles into the woods, off the main road. We were walking in the dark, heavily armed with AR-15s, sidearms, and fixed blade hunting knives in a hip sheath. So we really weren't afraid of anything. Plus, the moon was bright enough to navigate by, even under the trees. We had lights mounted on our rifles, and I had a large, powerful flashlight in my hand that I could make into a strobe or use as a club. The point is, we weren't paranoid of anything. We felt very prepared. We were heading back and we started to hear something hauling through the woods on our right. It was about to cross the trail in front of us. Most trails are old logging roads. They're pretty wide and they make square quadrants out of the forest. This particular trail cut across one of the quadrants and was overgrown and thin. We thought it was a deer or maybe a black bear. Either way, we couldn't shoot it at night. So instead of using the rifle lights, I used my handheld light. We waited until we heard it get near the trail, and then I turned my light on. All we saw was a pair of white legs cross the thin trail about 50 feet in front of us. They looked human. We were a little baffled, like what moron goes crashing through the deep woods at 1 a.m. in shorts and through the thick brush, not the trail. Super weird, but again, and armed as we were for hogs, we pushed on because it would have taken like 30 minutes extra to turn back and go around the quadrant. We hear crashing now and then in the woods, but it never got close to us again. Finally, we reached my car and I was relieved that it was still there and not broken into. We keep the rifles loaded, shove our handguns between the seat and the center console and get into the front seat. I begin to drive out of the forest with my moonroof open, 
and the stars were just gorgeous. It's easy to forget how amazing the night sky is in the middle of Ocala. About half a mile down the road, my headlights fall onto a man in a checkered button-down shirt and shorts, just walking along the road. We're miles from any paved road, and then it's another five to 10 miles on the paved road to get to a town. Also, this is in the northern part of the forest where there are no old cabins that were built before it was declared a national park. This dude had no backpack or anything. Was this what we saw across the path? If so, what was he doing walking out here at 1.30 to 2 in the morning with no supplies, no flashlight, nothing? He didn't even look at us as we passed. Anyway, as we got near the paved road, we unloaded the rifles and put them in the trunk and went home. It was a really fun trip and I can't wait to go back, but I will always be armed in Ocala. Something seriously weird is going on out there. On the evening of September 7th, 2006, my friend Jen and I were driving home from a friend's house near to where the Big Ear Radio Observatory used to be. It was somewhere around 10 p.m. near the corner of Cheshire Road and Route 23 between Delaware, Ohio and Lewis Center, Ohio. We were driving down Route 23 heading south toward Lewis Center when Jen saw a bright light very distant in the sky. We both jokingly said, it's probably a UFO. So we keep driving and we eventually lose sight and forget about the distant object in the sky. Then, as we're coming over the precipice of a hill, just beyond where the golf course is now, where the telescope once stood there, was an enormous glowing football-shaped UFO hanging right above our heads, steadily moving over top of Route 23, heading toward Lewis Center. It was the most frightening and awe-inspiring thing I have ever witnessed. We stopped on the side of the highway and got out of the car. It was the largest thing I've ever seen. I felt like an ant beneath the giant glowing boot. The object looked like it was engulfed in some orangish reddish plasma, almost like what the surface of the sun looks like close up from space. It looked as though it had flames bubbling and churning within it. I tried to take a video with my Motorola Razor, but the phone just would not pick it up at all, even though it had been working just fine and had nearly a full charge. It slowly begins to back away from us a bit and begins floating toward the town of Lewis Center. We follow it back to Lewis Center, where my friends and I watch it for nearly an hour, and eventually it begins to gain altitude in a dizzying display of lights. Then it flashes and blasted away in the blink of an eye, leaving behind a wispy blue teal vapor trail. I found out later on that the Big Ear Radio Observatory in Delaware, Ohio, was where they had received the wow signal in 1977. This object took up a large portion of the visible sky as we came upon it. I'm an airman. I have been trained to observe and identify aircraft I would estimate the object to be the size of an NFL football stadium just floating above the tree line highway and houses and buildings. The object was witnessed by at least five people other than myself. As it was gaining altitude, glowing bluish purplish orbs began to cascade out of the main shaped object, one after the other. Each time they would appear, they would revolve around the main object intensify until all I could see was a spinning blue glow around that main football stadium object. And then in the blink of an eye, it shot off into a flash of light in front of it, like the Enterprise going to warp speed, leaving only a bluish trailing haze behind. The whole experience was the most profound thing to have ever happened to me in my lifetime up till that point. Thank you for hearing my account of what occurred. Thank you. 
I was an EMT and then a paramedic for eight years before becoming a registered nurse. It was a decent sized city, 100,000 plus citizens, and loads of weird history. I had a lot of things happen, but this is the story that I will never forget. There was one house that we would go to pretty regularly that was beyond haunted. I don't know who or what lived and died in there before the then present patient. There were mannequins in the living room, several. I never asked because I didn't want to be in there any longer than necessary. The first time we were called there, I stood on the stoop trying to will my body to go in. The atmosphere in there was intimidating. It almost felt like the house was saying, come in if you dare. My partner was male, so I thought, meh, we'll be fine. I'm a five foot four female, and I can hold my own in a bar fight. Threatening presences I cannot see are another story. We get to our patient, and as I'm hooking up the EKG, someone backed into me, knocking me off the balls of my feet. I was squatting next to the couch. I tell my partner to back up, and he says, from what? I look up and he's on the other side of the room, nowhere near me or the couch. So I turn around. There's nothing there, but I'm eyeballing these mannequins up against the wall, a good 15 to 20 feet away. I shake it off and go back to what I'm doing, and again I'm knocked over. I tell my partner to knock it off, but now he isn't even in the room. He wandered to the kitchen to gather the patient's medications. Now I'm on my feet. There's no way that this happened twice from nothing. I turn back to these mannequins again. One has shifted slightly away from the wall, now standing with a shoulder to it, when before its back was against it. I asked the patient a bit too late if anyone else was in the home. Scene safety should have been first, but yeah, oops. She said no, it was just her and the cat. Thinking this cat must be a puma or something, I start to look for it. Unfortunately, Peanut was no bigger than my American size seven foot. I had only ventured to the hallway, maybe 10 feet from the couch, but out of view of the mannequins. When I walked back into the living room, that mannequin was now facing me. Every hair on my body stood up. Not today, Satan. We packaged her up got her in the truck for transport, and got away from that tiny house. Lo and behold, dispatch sends a request to my tablet for an explanation of a long scene time. I had to put harassed by mannequins in a run ticket without looking like I needed to be on a 72 hour hold. We went back to that house three more times that month. I called from the door for her to come to me. I'm not that stupid. I will never go in there again unless I absolutely have to. This happened a long time ago when my daughter was about two. She's now away at college, so I would estimate that this happened in about 2000. I'd been out shopping with my daughter, and she was crying on the way home in the car because she had dropped her sunglasses and couldn't reach them. I couldn't reach them either, and I told her that she would have to wait until we got home. When we got home, I grabbed the glasses from the floor of the car, took her out of her car seat, and we went in the house. As I carried her up the stairs, she was playfully trying to fit her little toddler sunglasses onto me. We were being silly and giggling, and I said, let's go see how mommy looks in the mirror with these on. And we went straight to the bathroom to check out my new shades. I turned on the light and held her up to the mirror over the sink. We were just being silly and making faces at each other when suddenly I noticed something in the reflection that should not have been there. As you look into the bathroom mirror with the door open, you could see the entire living room, which would be behind you, reflected in the mirror. My father 
who passed away in 1996, so about four years before this even happened, was seated at the end of the sofa, smiling at me. It was like I was frozen. I stood there, looking at him in the mirror, and absolutely couldn't move. I just gaped at him, then looked at my daughter's face in the mirror to see if she had noticed him. She was still too busy grinning and playing with the glasses to notice. I had enough time to get a really good look at him and note what he was wearing, which was rather nondescript. Just an off-white long-sleeved dress shirt, no tie, and dark slacks. Interestingly, this is not how he was dressed when we buried him. He was sitting rather casually, with one leg crossed over the other, and his left arm outstretched along the arm of the sofa. The whole vision, or whatever you want to call it, probably didn't even last 30 seconds, but it seemed like forever. After staring at him in stunned silence, I finally spun around with the baby in my arms to look out the door into the living room, and he was gone. My father passed away very suddenly, and I like to think that he came back just to have a peek at the granddaughter that he unfortunately never knew. He certainly seemed to be enjoying the little show we were putting on in the bathroom that day, judging by the grin he had on his face. A week or so after this happened, I was at my mom's house with my daughter, and my mom and I were talking at the kitchen table while my daughter played on the floor. Suddenly, she got up off the floor and walked over to an empty kitchen chair and said, That's Pop Pop's chair. To my knowledge, no one had ever told her that my father had had a favorite chair at the table where he always sat. I said to her, How do you know that that's Pop Pop's chair? She replied, Because he told me when I saw him last night. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. This story happened a few years ago. I lived in a building with my daughter, who grew attached to my neighbor's husband, Teddy, as if he were her dad. One day, while talking with my neighbor's wife, my daughter, who was two and a half years old at this time, came running to the door. But rather than running into my neighbor's apartment to go cuddle up Teddy, she froze at the doorway. She told his wife and I that we needed to be quiet, as Teddy was sleeping. Teddy was not sleeping. He was, in fact, sitting on the couch watching TV. Teddy stood up and called for my daughter to come see him. Again, my daughter looked at his wife and I and told us that Teddy was sleeping and that we needed to be quiet. I could see she was getting upset at the fact that we were laughing while telling her that Teddy was awake and wants you to go sit with him. Teddy started approaching the doorway where we were standing my daughter began to cry and ran into our apartment screaming, No, Teddy is sleeping. I could feel the goosebumps running across my body. That same day, my daughter went to a relative's place for a sleepover. I had invited my neighbors to come over for a bit and Teddy came over and explained that he wasn't feeling the best. He said that he was breathing in and out of a paper bag before coming to my apartment. I insisted he go to the hospital to make sure he was all right. On the way, Teddy fell ill and asked to pull over so he could be sick at the side of the road. As he was kneeling beside the car, Teddy suffered a major heart attack and passed away while on the way to the hospital. When the service was held for Teddy, I had such a strong feeling that I had to bring my daughter with me. She brought her favorite blanket with her, of course. When my daughter and I got to the funeral home for the viewing, we were greeted by everyone in Teddy's family. They all knew who my daughter was, as Teddy used to talk about her all the time. I held my daughter close as we walked up to the casket where Teddy laid. My daughter leaned down, almost as if she was going to whisper to him. She then told me, See, Teddy is sleeping, and he's really cold. She took her blanket and tucked Teddy in, then looked at me and said how he was warm and happy now. 
That night, as I sat alone in the living room, my phone began to ring. Four or five rings later, and still no name appeared. I quickly answered the phone in the middle of a ring, only to hear the dial tone. The call didn't even show up as an incoming call afterwards. It felt like Teddy had called us to say goodbye. It was so strange that my daughter knew there was something wrong with Teddy before anything even happened. A few months later, we went to go visit my grandmother, who was passing away from pancreatic cancer. My daughter refused to enter my grandmother's room. She kept saying how my grandmother was sleeping and that everyone should leave her alone to go sleep. I instantly began to cry. Only four days later, I got the call that my grandmother had passed away in her sleep. I can't quite understand this one myself, so maybe you guys can help. This was on the 11th of July, 2019. My boyfriend and I, he's now my husband, were camping in the mountains, very high up. This area is so high up and remote that there is virtually no light pollution, so you can see almost every star in the sky when it's a clear night, like this one was. We were just relaxing, staring at the stars, usual romantic things you do in the mountains, when we started noticing the stars acting very differently. They appeared to zigzag and go upward, almost like they were playing with one another, weaving near each other and away again in circular motions. We were just amazed by it all and couldn't take our eyes off the sky. This went on for about two to three solid hours. That wasn't the strangest part though. Where we were camping, there was a clear view of an opening between two other mountains. At around 2 a.m., maybe 3, I noticed this bright light between the two mountains. It was really bright, so I nudged my partner to look over too. We were staring at this massive white-yellow looking star go upward quickly, then noticed it was going toward us. My partner is a man that isn't easily scared, and this really scared him, to the point that he nearly broke my nose trying to hide fully in the tent with both of us screaming as this star just stopped right above us. When it was above us, right before we both panicked, it seemed to have a diamond-type shape, and it was super bright. But that isn't the strangest part. When we were in the tent, the light didn't shine through the tent. This thing didn't make a single noise, so it wasn't a drone or anything like that. It was far too big. And what seemed like seconds later, we were both calm, looking at the stars again, like nothing happened, until sunrise. If both of us hadn't experienced this, if it was just one of us, I could try to make an excuse for it but we both confirm each other's stories and saw the same exact thing, and I can't explain it. To top it all off, when I'm talking about it, or in this case typing, it feels like I'm lying and my partner feels the same way, like it never happened. It feels like I'm making it up, and the more I try to remember about that night, the more I can't remember. And he feels the same way too. It's like whenever I go to tell my story, something is actively trying to get me to believe that I didn't see what I saw or to stop talking about it. Has anyone else ever experienced anything like this? Does anyone have some answers? I'd love to know. My mom, my mom grew up near northern Wisconsin, and she told me some stories a while back which happened to her, her brothers, and others in their area. 
and I feel that some of them are worth mentioning. I've had my own paranormal experiences, which I feel are quite difficult to talk about, and I've talked about a few of them on Reddit. But for now, I want to tell you another one of my mom's stories. One of the stories my mom told me was something that had happened to a family that had apparently lived nearby them. There was a family driving through the forests and eventually their car broke down. This would have been in the 70s or 80s before cell phones were widespread. So they ended up getting out of their vehicle and making the journey home on foot. Eventually, however, they started to notice sounds from behind them as if something was following them through the woods or perhaps more aptly put, stalking them through the woods. When they ran, it ran. When they stopped, it stopped. Eventually, they were able to get to their house and they quickly entered, slammed the door and locked it. Whatever was following them let out a bellowing scream. Apparently, the family had alerted my grandfather as to what had happened and told him to look into his fields. According to my mom, he had apparently come back into the house, wide-eyed and alarmed, but he didn't elaborate on what he saw. I vaguely recall my mom talking about him seeing some sort of glow in the field, though. I'm unsure if it's related, but my oldest uncle went horseback riding with a friend, and they apparently came across this thing. Apparently, it was white and furry, and when it saw my uncle Mike and his friend, it stood up on its hind legs, bounded over a fence, and ran off. Apparently, it left behind some fur, which my uncle apparently collected, but this would have been many, many years ago, and my uncle died when I was about four years old in a bad accident, so I'm unable to ask him about the story. I'm unsure if both of these stories are related or not, and there could be some natural causes to these things. Black bears, wolves, dogs, etc. All would be living in the area. However, judging by the tone of the story, and the fact that such animals are rather commonplace and it was apparently during the day, I'm not sure if it would have been mistaken identity or not. What does interest me, though, are the stories of the Wendigo, Skinwalkers, and the Wisconsin-Michigan Dogman. Could it be related if it was not a case of mistaken identity? I don't know, and I don't really care to find out either. Just be careful in the woods. Mother Nature can be a cruel mistress, and there is darkness in the world. Be it supernatural or the very, very real depths of human depravity and cruelty. Protect yourself and your loved ones. All the homes in my neighborhood were built in 2009 or 2010, seven homes in all. One of the homes across the street was purchased by a single female with two boys and a child on the way. Her boyfriend did live with her, but didn't help purchase the home, and he was not a good guy. They fought all the time. I'm pretty sure he was on meth, and he cheated on her constantly. He even tried to approach me. So, I reiterate, not a good guy. Toward the end, he started getting abusive. She had him locked up, but let him come back when he got out. One day, an ambulance showed up at the home. We were all told that he had committed suicide, had gotten high on meth and shot himself in the bathroom. All right, this was believable. After his death, she asked me to help her watch the home as his friends and family were accusing her of killing him and were pulling up into her driveway and then leaving and basically just trying to harass her. I thought this was suspicious, but whatever. As a single mom, she had to work all the time. The oldest boy would watch the little one while she worked. He would always come down to my house to stay, but wouldn't tell me why. But I liked the kid, so no worries. About four years went by like this and she told me she was moving. 
I was kind of shocked because these were really nice homes and fairly cheap, but I figured it was just because of what had happened previously. Finally, she told me that they were moving because of the paranormal activity in the home since his death. The little one was the most bothered by it, and that's why he stayed at my house all the time. She proceeded to tell me what really happened. They were in a fight, and he had a gun in his hand and was threatening to shoot her. They had a struggle over the gun, resulting in him shooting himself behind the ear. He fell to the ground, crawled down the hallway, and died in the living room. The little one said that he could see him at night, crawling down the hallway. The doors would open and close on their own, and they would hear disembodied voices and feel negative energy, stuff like that. She said her guests would see and hear stuff too. She wouldn't go into much detail, and I understood why. I didn't press the issue. The boys were struggling in school, and she wasn't doing so well either. They moved, and the house sat empty for about a year now. Well, my daughter and her husband have decided to purchase this home. I asked them what they would do if they saw him crawling down the hallway at night. They joke about it, but I mean, come on. That would be some scary shit. If you've never really experienced anything paranormal before, or hell, even if you had. My son-in-law is a huge skeptic, but my daughter has had some experiences. I wonder if it's still active or if he moved on when they left. A morbid part of me can't wait to find out. To cut an extremely long story short, my friend used to live in a house that was well into the woods. One day, he told me something was happening around his house, so I spent the night. We sat with our backs to the wall, and the window cracked just a bit, on the second story. As we were talking, we started hearing strange noises coming from the woods. We were shocked as we peeked to see what it could be. Between his house and the woods was a big open area. We could faintly see the open area because of the moonlight, but we couldn't see into the pitch blackness of the woods. Suddenly, some large white creature that looked like a naked man creeped out. It was bald, and its eyes were glowing. When we freaked out, I yelped a bit too loudly, causing it to stop and go back into the woods. The next day, being the curious people we were, we decided to go out into the woods and search. Eventually, we found a strange uprooted tree with a bunch of holes in the ground. We heard heavy breathing coming from somewhere inside, but we decided not to go in there looking. A few weeks went by and nothing. I came back to his house just to have a sleepover. He asked me to go grab one of his bikes off the back porch. I went back there through the garage but as I was grabbing it, I felt like something was watching me. I looked off toward the woods, but saw nothing. Suddenly, I heard a strange noise literally over my head. I looked up at the roof, which was only about seven feet off the ground in that section of the house due to the elevation of the porch, and I saw a similar creature sitting on the roof just feet from my face. When I panicked, it shrieked in my face, and I ran back into the garage and slammed the door shut. My friend ran into the garage from inside the house to see what had happened, and I was panicking, telling him to lock everything. We locked ourselves inside and waited for his dad to come back. This was around six to eight o'clock at night. I don't remember exactly, but it was closer to the night. His dad was in the military and decided to step out and take a look after he came home and we told him what had happened. He saw that same creature in the distance, just on the edge of the woods, but he had no explanation for us as to what it could be. It's been five years since that happened, and now I've been seeing sightings of things just like it all over the place. YouTube, Reddit, Facebook. It's really been haunting me lately thinking back on that sound that it made when it shrieked and the way it looked. It was terrifying, 
Its eyes seemed very strange, too. I kind of tied two and two together and figured that it must live beneath the ground somewhere and only come up when it's dark. Has anyone else witnessed anything like this? I live about a mile or two from an old abandoned school that is very haunted. I've heard a few stories about it, and I have an experience there that I would like to share with you. It's a relatively short story, but it freaked me the hell out. I pass this school every time I drive home from work at night, and one night I got home pretty late, like around midnight. Anyway, I was passing the school, and there was a dead cat in the road. I turned around and pulled over in front of the intersection, directly across from the school. I had a friend with me, and we'll call him Chance. We got out of my truck and examined the body of the cat. As I was walking over, I looked up at the school just for a look, just seeing if I saw anything because of how late it was. I didn't, and we continued on to the cat. What we saw was pretty gruesome, I'll spare you but I went back to my truck and grabbed some wipes I had tucked behind the front seat. It's a single cab, so I put things back there that I don't always need up front. Anyway, I put a few in the palms of my hands, completely covering them, so that I could safely pick up the cat and move it to some bushes to the left of the intersection. Chance and I walked back to the truck without glancing at the school a second time, until we were back in the truck putting on our seatbelts, in shock because of what we'd just seen. But it gets worse. I glanced at the school one more time before putting it in drive, and there was a man and a woman standing directly in front of the school, just standing there, staring at the school while holding hands. Chance is looking at his phone, so I tap his shoulder to get his attention. I say to him, bro, look and we just freeze for a second. I didn't see them at all when I glanced at the school before, and I would have at least seen them walking toward the front of the school when I had first walked over to the cat. The school's pretty wide, and it takes a minute to get to where this couple was standing. They just appeared out of thin air. Once that hit me, I put it in drive and drove up the road to the point where I could turn around and start heading home. Creeping by the school intersection, we looked to see if they were still there, and they were. As we passed the intersection, the man turned around quickly and stared directly at us. I have never floored my truck as hard as I did that night. I actually spun the tires when I took off. We made it back home in no time and pulled into the driveway and just sat there for a minute, contemplating what we'd just seen. Eventually, we got our wits together and went in, and Chance asked if he could just stay the night, and I agreed. I didn't want to go past that school again, so I didn't want him to. This happened over a month ago. Chance and I have had a falling out, and I haven't had any more experiences driving past that school. But that incident still messes with me to this day. A few months ago, an experience at the end of an exhausting work shift left me questioning reality and my own sanity. I'm a nurse, and I had just started a new job at a nursing home about 45 minutes away. The pay was good, and the hours suited me, especially the 16-hour weekend double shifts. But on one particular weekend, my routine was disrupted when they asked me to work both morning and evening. That Sunday night, my relief was late. I wasn't too bothered since I was already behind on charting, but then things got busier, as a resident fell and had to be sent to the ER. After handling the situation and the additional paperwork, I finally left work at about 1 to 2 in the morning, 
ending up with nearly a 20-hour shift following a 17-hour shift the day before. I was drained, but I felt okay to drive. My car is too small to sleep in, and I couldn't get a hold of a friend. My route home is scenic, with twists, turns, and views of the lake, which usually helps me keep awake. But that night, I realized I had left my glasses behind. My vision was blurry, but I was too exhausted to turn back. As I was driving through a wooded area, a bright light, like a spotlight, caught my eye. It was coming through the trees. As I followed the road, I came across a thin figure, dressed in skin-tight black clothes, kneeling over a deer by the side of the road. The spotlight was directed at him. I remember thinking how strange it was, but my thoughts were slow and my eyes were straining without my glasses. I slowed down and rolled down my window, asking if he needed any help. The figure turned, and I was frozen by what I saw. It wasn't human. It was tall, with a large head and enormous eyes, like an alien depicted in stories, but not small and frail. It began to approach my car, and a voice in my head commanded, sleep. I blinked, and suddenly it was gone, along with the deer, and it was nearly 4 a.m. My car was parked, and I had no memory of pulling over. I tried to call my sister, but I ended up calling my workplace instead. The colleague who answered stayed on the line until I got home, under the pretense that I had fallen asleep and didn't want it to happen again. I tell myself that I must have fallen asleep, that it was all a big hallucination born of exhaustion. But deep down, I'm haunted by the thought, the knowledge, that it was real. The fear of what might have happened, whether from falling asleep at the wheel or encountering something completely inexplicable, still lingers. I haven't shared this story with anyone, as it terrifies me just to think about it. But it's a memory that refuses to fade, leaving me forever wondering, what if? It was around 10 o'clock at night, off a little ways from Ocean City, Maryland. It was mother, her boyfriend, my sister, and I. We were driving home from our vacation, and I asked if we could take the back roads. I always loved seeing the woods at night, and it was the scenic route. We were driving down, and although I was the one who asked for the trees, I was on my phone, texting, and listening to music. We eventually came to a stretch of road that I didn't pay much attention to. It was boring, but I occasionally looked up every now and then as I'd had the entire ride. It was a straight path forward with nothing but street lights. So we were driving and driving and as we crossed under the lights, it was almost relaxing. I went into a half sleep trance. Then I suddenly woke up and everything was fine. More lights as we drove by. No one was talking. My mom's boyfriend wasn't asleep, but there were no muffled conversations. Everything seemed calm. But I had this sudden awareness. We were in the middle of the woods. It was dark and around 11.30 to midnight, and without the streetlights, you couldn't see anything but the stars. I immediately felt a very paranoid vibe and turned my phone on and listened to music. Then we entered back on another streetlight stretch, and we drove on. The strange part is, it's almost like something told me to go on my phone, as if there was a notification, but I checked and nothing was there. When I did this though, I noticed something in my peripheral. There were about four lights up ahead that were turned off, in an area where the road kind of turns. This was a fairly wooded area and you couldn't see much without light so we slowed down. I didn't pay much attention to it, but this next part sticks with me. As we slowly approached the next light that was on, something crawled out from the woods and into the light. I looked up and thought it was a deer at first, but it kept moving out. It was limping, 
But when it was fully emerged, what I saw was truly bone chilling. A naked, ash white, skinny man crawled out on all fours. It stopped, and as I saw it, it turned its head toward us. Its eyes were a deep charcoal black. We sped up fast and started driving. It was not human. As we drove past it, it jumped over our car, weightlessly, defying physics. My mom's Mercedes had two sunroofs, and although it was a blur, I got a close look at it. As it passed over the car, it landed behind us and faded into the black. The scary part was, when it jumped over our car, the sunroof was open. I'm glad we got out of there. I'm a 30-year-old man, blonde, blue-eyed, and a work ethic like Boxer from Animal Farm. I work at a BJ's wholesale club from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, pushing carts, filling propane tanks, and helping out where they need me. In the mornings, I usually walk around the parking lot while listening to a queue of music and podcasts that I line up for myself the day before. All of it going in through one earbud, while I have the other ear open, paying attention to my surroundings. Also, I'm not really prone to unusual or paranormal happenings in my life. So needless to say, the following event really caught me by surprise. To set the stage, it was between 8 and 9 in the morning. The sun was out, and I'd already gotten the propane filling station set for the day and I pushed all the shopping carts left in the parking lot and stalls overnight back to where they needed to be near the store entrance. I'm about to do what I call my morning perimeter walk. This walk involves walking the outer edge of the parking lot and behind the store to make sure that nothing is out of place and that nobody has taken it upon themselves to tag the back of the store, leaving me to photograph it and show the store management at the most opportune moment. I've just started my perimeter walk, and I'm just about into an episode of the Rooster Teeth podcast, always open on Spotify. I'm minding my own business, tunnel visioning out, and suddenly I hear a woman's voice humming in my left ear. Thinking back, it reminded me a little bit of the lullaby hummed by the Huntress in the game Dead by Daylight. This snapped me out of my routine. I paused the podcast and I took the earbud out of my right ear. I listened carefully to get an idea of where the humming was coming from for about a minute and a half, but it had completely stopped. All I heard was the usual background noise. It was too close for it to be any car audio from a car pulling out from behind me. I would have heard the engine and the sound of the tires against the pavement and veered out of the way for them to pass. I want to make it clear that nobody is walking around the parking lot aside from me. Everyone else is either filling up at the gas station or in the store. There's a manager who comes out and sits in their truck at the end of the parking lot where this happened, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen when this took place. After coming to grips with the fact that I'm nearing my two-year anniversary working at this store and that there's no way it was anything that wanted to hurt me, I just shrugged it off and continued onward to tackle the rest of the day. I had never had an auditory experience like that before in the nearly two years that I've worked there, and I didn't experience anything like that for the rest of that weekend. I don't know if anybody else has had an experience like that, but if you have, let me know. I'd honestly like to share in the experience. Back in 2019, my girlfriend and I went on a vacation to an island in Italy. Everything went well, except that the last day it did rain a little bit. It didn't rain a lot though. The streets were dry, but the sky was gray, and we came back to our little house at about 5pm because of the weather. 
We got bored pretty quickly, and we had to wait at least three or four hours before going to eat at a restaurant. So I decided to visit the only part of the island I hadn't seen. We got on the motorbike and went to Calafante, which I found out was totally abandoned due to a collapse that had happened in 2017. The whole neighborhood was as neglected and deserted as the beach and the restaurant were. And I swear we passed through every house, road, or parking lot. And it was just deserted. Nobody lived there. Not even a tourist or a car. I think that the collapse of the beach made that spot a little bit less interesting. Anyway, I kept driving in that neighborhood until I ended up at a dead-end street near a football field. But there were two kids playing football on the end of the street. And people noticed that every house nearby was shut closed. Not a single sign of a human being for kilometers, so where did these two kids come from? We got close, and my girlfriend and I were already a little bit freaked out. But I wanted to talk to them, because if I remember correctly, I was looking for a place that I couldn't find, and I thought perhaps they would know where it was. We approached them. They were no more than six or seven years old, dirty as hell, like just came out of a coal mine dirty. One kid had a white, more like a gray, dirty and torn t-shirt, and the other only had his rag-like pants on. Both of them were without shoes and with their hair completely shaved. The shirtless kid had a circular wound, more like a hole right in the middle of his pectorals. It was red, bloody, and new like he had just been shot in the middle of the chest. I asked them this thing and they answered me, but I couldn't understand a thing. It wasn't like the local dialect or any Italian dialect at all. It was completely incomprehensible. They kept talking and pointing at my bike. We couldn't understand a thing, so we just said goodbye and made a U-turn. I could see them staring at us from my mirrors. We were so freaked out. They looked pretty injured, but they were acting super casual. I don't know why, but my girlfriend and I are pretty sure they were some kind of ghost. Like maybe kids that died in the World War or something like that. I don't know if it's a proper paranormal encounter, but it's the only story that I still can't explain.